you know, it's been, well, over 2,000 years ago that Jesus was born on this earth, right? Wow. And we're still celebrating that birth. You know what that tells me? That has to be a special birth. It has to be a miraculous. We talked about that, didn't we? A miraculous birth. Miracles meaning something that man cannot do. So, praise God, we're still celebrating and still acknowledging. What do you have? Okay. <laughs> well, that ain't fair, but you know I'll do it. <laughs> and some of you know, and some probably don't know, but this this man and wife they they serve us every day of the week, twenty four hours a day. Anytime we need them, we call on them, and they're there. And doesn't, some of you know, some of you don't, never takes a salary. A servant of God never takes a salary. This morning, we want to give you a little something for Christmas. There's gift cards, and there's, I don't know, Becky got to fill in the blood. But there's some things that you probably can go and enjoy and have a little fun with. Okay. And we certainly do appreciate you both very much. Love you, dear. Thank you, dear. Thank you. I will. All right. And the gifts keep a coming. <laughs> Amen. Well, uh, Barb and I do thank you all so much, and we we don't do it for these reasons, but we appreciate it. It's all I can say. So thank you, and God bless you. It's a privilege. Amen. So where were we? We were celebrating the birth of Jesus. <laughs> Amen. And that's good. We can, yeah, God bless you. Um, I do want to, I won't keep you very long, I don't think, this morning, but there is something I want to share with you, and it does have to do with uh, the birth of Christ and the great account that we have in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1. I do want to read some of these uh, verses of Scripture. Uh, if you have your Bible, go there to Luke chapter 1. We'll begin reading in verse 26. Now, this has to do with the great annunciation, if you will, or the announcement of Gabriel, the archangel of God, appearing unto... Um, uh, Mary in the city of Galilee named Nazareth, Nazareth, and, uh, and let's just read some of these and then uh, I will make a few comments beginning down about uh, verse 34, but let's begin reading in verse 26 here where it says, and in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin that was a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. 
Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? Now, the context here would be like this uh, conception was going to be an immediate conception, not something that would happen on down the way. So that's the reason Mary was, how can this be? This is not natural. This is not normal. And it says in verse 35, uh, well, Mary wondered about it, of course. And then in verse 35, it says, And the angel answered and said unto her, to explain that, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, that the holy thing that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now this was a creative act of the Holy Spirit. It was not some kind of a mythological union of divine powers and, and human spirits or why. This was a creative act. It was much like in Genesis 1 of where it says the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God moved over the face of the deep, brooded over the waters, and, and it was the same way of saying here that the Holy Ghost will overshadow thee. Now, verse 36 says, uh, Behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. Uh, another uh, miraculous thing there, but not like the one with Mary. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Notice verse 37 says this. It says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. So we see here that God can do and what is impossible with man, God can do. You remember in the scripture there where Jesus would say, you know, how can a rich man, they ask, and enter into the kingdom of heaven? Jesus said, with man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Amen? Um, it's like riches can't save you. Nothing in this world can save you. Only God can save you. Right? Now, so, now this is the scripture I want to deal with. Verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Mm, behold. Said it to Gabriel. Be it unto me according to thy word. Hmm. And the angel departed from her. You know, I think Gabriel thought, with that statement, my work is done. I'm ready to go back to heaven. Amen. Now, Gabriel came from God, made that announcement. Now, the thing here that I sense in these scriptures that stands out, they are essential to God choosing Mary to be the mother of His Son. Her humility, you can see it there, that's what stood out so greatly and why God chose her. I was thinking of the scripture found in uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. Uh, and I want to read a few of these scriptures, beginning in verse 1, where it says, At the same time the disciples came in Jesus and saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall humble himself as a little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let me, let me tell you something. This is essential. Jesus made a very specific point here of why uh, humility has 
to be in a person's life for God to use them. Now, in the book of James, chapter 4, and verse 6, it says, It's God that gives more grace. Now, we think of Mary in this context, that Mary uh, obtained or received favor from God, and she did. And we understand that favor and grace are very similar. God's undeserved favor is what we, how we define grace a lot of times. I don't deserve it. He gives me His favor. That's grace. But it says, it's God that gives us this grace, wherefore He saith, God resisteth the proud but gives grace unto the humble. Mm. Did you know how Mary got her grace and her favor with God? The same way you and I do. Amen? She humbled herself in the sight of God. So, the other thing that I want to point out about Mary would be found in verses 46 through 49. And it says here, the Magnificent, as we call it, that Mary said in this, My soul doeth magnify the Lord. That's another uh, virtue of Mary. For my spirit hath rejoiced, in God my Savior. Now, I want to say this. This is pointing out that some people might say, well, Mary was without sin. Well, it says right here, she rejoiced in God her Savior. Mary needed a Savior the same way you and I need a Savior. Now, uh, he, she called God her Savior. For He, God, hath regarded the low estate of this, notice this submissiveness, of His handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. You know, she was blessed. She was chosen. It was God gave her favor, yes. It did, the Bible did not say above men, women, like she was something different, special from creation or birth. It says among women, all right? But Mary presented herself in this humility and met the qualifications that God required in order to have His Son born into this world. Amen? Now, the verse 38 in Luke chapter 1 again says that Mary said, Be it unto me according to thy word. I tell you, now that is a statement. It's a, it is one of the greatest statements of faith that I've ever read in the Bible. Be it unto me according to thy word. Now, that's something you can meditate on. Every one of us ought to meditate on it. And let me tell you something. What she was saying there is very similar. I hope you can remember. I hope you've been born again by the Spirit of God. But when you came to uh, know God and got saved, and you made that confession with your mouth because you believed it in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? You accepted Him as your personal Savior. Did you know there something goes along with being saved? It's not just... I got saved, now I can go on. No, no, no. You made a commitment. Remember? Lord, I will follow you. I mean, some of you, I can probably tell you, 
when you got saved, you were down to about as low as you could get, and you didn't have anywhere to turn, and you, you probably even made promises to God that no earthly man could ever fulfill. <laughs> I know of some people that, that did that, you know. But yet again, you're making a commitment unto God whenever you call Him Lord. Mary made a commitment to this angel, be it unto me according to thy word that she heard from God's angel. So anyway, we are saying unto God, God, take me, make me, break me, shake me, whatever it takes, use me for your glory. That's what a person should be saying when they get saved, right? I'm tired of the old life. I'm ready to walk in a new life. I'm ready to go, Lord. And when you call Jesus Lord, you better call Him Lord of all. Amen. Right? Amen. Hallelujah. Use me for your glory. Now, here's the thing, church. Mary made a great faith statement. You know what? Her faith was going to get tried. Once you open your mouth and you make a big faith statement, you better be ready because the devil ain't going to like it. I'm not telling you not to make them. I'm telling you you can make them. You better make them. You better make a confession of faith. You better... You remember what? You get saved and the devil comes against you with all hell breaks loose, seems like, you know. If you really got saved, that can happen. Because he's against everything God's doing. So, here's the thing. Your faith is going to be tried. And Mary was in a very difficult situation. Yeah. We think of it. We have manger scenes. We have uh, Joseph and Mary going from Nazareth to Bethlehem, Judea. We have all these things. We have manger scenes of a little baby, and, and all of those are praying. I love them, I'll be honest. I love all, I like the story. It, I mean, Hollywood could take a story like that and from a human standpoint make a movie out of it. But it's more than a movie. <laughs> hey man, it's real. It's, the, it's God sending His Son. So, I mean, all of this story is, is fascinating. And, and, and I think a lot of people pick up on it and because of that. It's God doing something great. But anyway, all of these scenes are precious. But let me tell you something. What happened in Mary's heart that caused her to make that statement, Be it unto me, according to thy word, took some faith as, no doubt, I'd say possibly a teenager whenever... The angel spoke to her and she gave birth to Jesus. This took something because I really believe that Mary knew something. Being in a difficult situation, she had to know this much. She was betrothed to a man named Joseph. Never had any relationships with Joseph. But she knew with this child being born in her, being born, that Joseph was going to know one thing for sure, that's not my child. So she was going to have a difficult situation. We know the angel explained it to Joseph. and Thank God he did. But let me, fear not, Joseph, take unto Mary thy wife. You know the story. But let me tell you something. She was facing... And you will too in your life once you step out in faith and make a faith statement. Yeah, the devil's going to bring things against you. Everything, but his weapons of his warfare are carnal. I'm glad of that. See, everything, everything Mary was facing here was carnal weapons. Amen? What was Joseph going to think? Mm -hmm. Now, another thing, she was going to face the stigma 
of an unwed mother. Now, back in those days, that was not a good thing. Should never be a good thing, but, you know, it was not a good thing. Also, she was going to be accused of adultery. Hmm. See all the battles that she had to face in making that statement? And she knew something else. I, I'm convinced Mary knew something about the law, the law of Moses. She knew that a person that was found guilty of adultery was punishable by law by being stoned to death. Now, wow. Somebody said, wait a minute. <laughs> I might want to think this one over before I step out here. Mm -hmm. how, how would you react? How would I react knowing all these things? But let me tell you something once again. All of these things were carnal. All of these accusations and all these things that would come against her was of the enemy. Here's the bottom line of it. Yet, in spite of all of these difficulties, in spite of what she was going to have to go through, yet, yet, she wholeheartedly I don't see anything being held back here in verse 38 when she said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it according to me. I don't see it. I think it was with her whole heart. She submitted herself to the will of God. Mm. Amen. Did you know... In that scripture over there that I read in James chapter 4 a while ago, of where uh, it says, you know, uh, God, you know, we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and uh, He resists the proud, gives grace to them. You know the verse before that tells us, but the spirit that dwelleth, dwelleth, dwelleth in us lesteth to envy. You know what that's saying? God wants every bit of you. That's exactly what that scripture means. And Mary was not holding back. Lord, here I am, totally devoted, totally submitted unto your will. Now that meant something, church. Somebody said, well, give me a little more definition of faith. Well, faith sometimes really put you to the test of how much you're trusting God. Amen? Mary was trusting God to make all things possible even when it seemed impossible. You didn't get around the law in those days very easily, let me tell you. You didn't get around people's opinions. Well, you don't today either. But let me tell you something. She knew she was going to face them, but she still had to trust God with everything's going to be all right. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Get it down. Take that lesson right there. I'm going to apply it here in a couple of things to finish my message this morning and apply it to ourselves right now, the day we're living in, of what it would mean to make the statement that Mary made. All you have to do to get the devil stirred up in your life is live godly. <laughs> he knows it right off. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer Persecution. No ifs, ands, or maybes. Mm -hmm. So, living godly brings persecution. It'll bring rejection. Mm -hmm. It'll bring misunderstanding. Well, yeah, there was some that would misunderstand Mary. 
Did you know Jesus was probably one of the most misunderstood men that ever walked to the face of the earth? Amen? The Apostle Paul, he had to go back time and again and write to these churches and say, you got me wrong, you didn't understand. And he had to make it straight. No, I'm not here after your money. I'm after your soul. Right? Misunderstood. Living godly will get you misunderstood from time to time. Living godly will even bring upon you the shame of this of people in the world shaming you. And also, let me tell you something, it'll bring reproach into your life. Amen. How much? How much? I ask myself this question. I've, I've been asking it quite a bit here lately. How much am I willing to suffer for righteousness sake? Mm -hmm. See, sometimes you can kindly uh, lower your standard or your conviction. And uh, you can avoid some things in your life. How much are you willing to still suffer those things to see the will of God done in your life? Amen? Let me go to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. And um, I want us to look here in verse 1, okay? Hebrews 12 and 1. The writer, I believe, of the Apostle Paul. But anyway, he says, We're foreseeing that we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin and the sin that doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, here's what we're supposed to do. Somebody said, well, I'm... I'm, I'm Maybe I'm going to back off a little bit and try to avoid some of this, um, you know, contempt of the world and, 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 you know. No, 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 that's the wrong direction. <laughs> Faith has one gear, and it's a forward gear. Amen? One gear forward. Here's what we are told by the Bible to do when we are facing these kind of situations where we're taking a stand like Mary took. Now, I know she, well, she could look unto Jesus, I guess. But they, anyway, knowing that He's the Son of God. But here's what it says for us to do today. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. You think the things that you're going through in this world may be pretty tough. Nothing measures up to the cross. Nothing. Nobody could have endured what Jesus endured except Jesus. I'm here to tell you. It wasn't a physical all. It was mental. It was everything thrown on Him. The weight of the sin of the whole world. Amen. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, endured the cross. What did he do? He despised the shame. Oh, yeah, the cross was shameful. Only bad people hung on a cross, right? Cursed people hung on a cross. Jesus, I'll do it. I know it's going to be shameful. I'll do it. And now he is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, verse 3 again. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied in, and faint in your minds. Amen? Don't ever try to fight a battle like Mary was fighting. And you may have fought some. I feel like I might have fought a few in my life. Don't ever try to fight them on your own. You're way ahead of the game if you'll just consider Jesus to start with. Amen. Consider what He went through. 
Consider what he endured. And then let me tell you, it'll sure make your trial a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, one more scripture. Luke chapter 14. Uh, this, this, in, in Luke chapter 14, I, I want us to uh, start here in verse 25. And we'll try to close with this thought. It says, and this is talking about discipleship being tested. And it says here in, in verse 25, And there went great multitudes with him, and he returned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and also his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. Did I read that right? I believe I did. I read it more than one time myself. That's what Jesus said. I don't think there's any question after reading that verse of Scripture to say that Jesus set the cost high. He didn't say it'd be easy. He set it pretty high. To, to, to be what? To be His disciple. To be His disciple. Now, does that mean, I want to clarify this. No, Jesus is not saying you have to get mad at your mother and father and brother. No, he's not talking about that. He said you can't put those things ahead of Him. You still with me? Does that make you feel a little better? <laughs> it made me feel better. <laughs> Amen. To know that, no, He's not wanting me to go out here and hold grudges. And all. No, 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 no. No, we're to love everybody. But that's what Jesus said. So he set the, the standard way up there. Because you know why? Too many of us, and I said us, that includes me, uh, we, we could take something like that, being Jesus' disciples, and we could explain a lot of things away and put a lot of things ahead of him. Jesus wanted to make sure you wasn't putting anything ahead of him. Gabriel wanted to make sure that Mary wasn't putting anything ahead of her calling. Right? Nothing. Be it unto me according to thy word. Signed, sealed, delivered. Amen? Jesus, when he made this statement, and I want to read just a little bit more here in Luke 14. He said in verse 27, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Once again, cannot. You got a cross, I got a cross. Amen? We all have a cross. We are actually told to take it up daily and follow Him, right? Verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, setteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest haply, after he had laid the foundation, he is not able to finish it. And all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Run with patience the race that is set before you. Amen? What are you in a race to do? Finish. Right? You're in a race to finish, aren't you? Now, when Jesus made these statements about discipleship and counting the cost, there's one thing that I'm well convinced of. Jesus knew very well, first-handed, I guess you could say, he knew what his own mother endured 
so that the Savior of this world could be born. He knew that. Mm -hmm. He knew what Mary went through. Amen. He knew all this. So he set the, the bar pretty high, didn't he? Now, the Savior of the world had to be born. Somebody said, well, the cost was awful high. You know what I'm going to say to that? But the price was right. I said the price was right. It was worth it. <laughs> you got it? I said it was worth it. Without it, everybody here would be lost. Amen. Whatever the cost, God was willing to pay it. Whatever the cost, we need to be willing to say what Mary said. According to thy word, be it unto me. Amen. Let me finish on a, a Christmas thought here. The best way to celebrate, celebrate Christmas, and we do have to remind people from year to year, I guess, is to keep Christ in Christmas. Right? I, I look around and yeah, I can tell. I, I don't think I've ever been that guilty because I, I guess I've not celebrated like a lot of people do in my lifetime, but don't hold that against me, please. But anyway, <laughs> I see some people that gets caught up, as we were talking this morning, party here, party there, party everywhere. We get caught up in all of the festivities and everything like that. And I can understand, it. it's easy to forget about Christ. But the best way to celebrate Christmas is, yes, to keep Christ in Christmas. And the best way you can do that is to be His disciple indeed. Amen? Be His disciple. So that's the reason I'm going to say that the best way that we can uh, do that is to be like Mary and say this, according to your word, O God, be it unto me. And if a person can do that, I honestly don't believe there's a better way that you can say Merry Christmas to all. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But I think it's good that we remind ourselves from the scripture that I gave you this morning that there was a tremendous price that was paid just for Jesus to be born. Amen. He paid a price after he was born. Mary paid a price and others did too so he could be born. Amen. And Jesus made it very clear. Count the cost. What it cost God to give His Son. What it cost us to be His disciple. Amen. And then you'll understand that everything is not free. Some things come with a pretty high price tag.